And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. A matter of courtesy. Everybody loved Cressy Carless. Everybody said they'd never known anyone quite like her. Her heart, they said, was as big as she was. And Cressy was a big woman. She had a generous, wide-open frankness about her. A hearty friendliness that penetrated the quick, stinging wit that made her famous. Yes, everybody loved Cressy Carless. Everybody except perhaps her husband, Matt. The two of them owned and operated Club Carless the most successful and expensive of all the night spots in town. As Julie Bradford, featured singer at the club, was singing her big number, Cressy moved about and joked and kidded the customers, and they ate it up. Hiya, Cressy. Come on in to count the suckers, huh? Hello, Jack. Nice to see you standing up for a change. <laughs> at your prices, who can buy enough to do otherwise? Huh? <laughs> You're wrong, Jack. We don't charge enough, or we wouldn't still be getting bums like you. <laughs> They think you're a character, don't they, Chris? You leave them with a smile. But you always get the last withering word, don't you? You move from the bar and make your way through the tightly packed tables until you reach your own, your private table, yours and Matt's. Hello, Matt. I want to talk to you about... Shh, Chrissy, don't mess up Julie's number. Looks like a good night. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Let me listen to you. You glance at Matt, then at Julie, the same. The warm, friendly smile remains fixed on your face. It fools a lot of people. But no one fools you, do they, Chris? You know all about Matt and Julie. And you don't care. She can have him, can't she? Yes, you'd give Matt to Julie tonight. But there's the club. Matt's half-owner. And Club Carlos is the one thing you won't part with. You won't really be satisfied until it all belongs to you. No matter what price you have to pay. She's terrific. Best we've ever had. That flame velvet nothing she calls a costume doesn't hurt it. Uh, she can sing, too. Hey, Julie, Julie, over here. Oh, hello, Matt. Come on, Julie, sit down with the bosses. You get better service. You got to take him, Matt. Oh, hi, Cressy. Hello, Julie. You were good tonight. Why, Cressy, you'll turn my head in flattery like that. Uh, let me order you a drink, Julie. Oh, no, thanks. Remember that. Oh, right? yes, that's right. You never touch anything on the job. Uh -uh. Well, I never do either. Oh, I always have a drink before I come to the club. Just one at home. You do? Mm -hmm. That's funny. So do I. Well, you two ought to be able to build a great friendship on a coincidence like that. <laughs> <laughs> Get her. Uh, giving us the customer treatment. No, uh, <laughs> I don't think so. The customer is always right, but um, I've got a hunch Cressy doesn't think we're so right, Matt. Oh, that's where you're wrong, Julie. I think you two deserve each other. <laughs> Your eyes meet for just a moment, yours and Julie. She doesn't like you very much, does she, Chris? You decide to exit on that line. You're not ready to tangle with Julie yet, are you? So you get up from the table, move among your guests, see that they get the best liquor, the best food, and that they pay the best prices for it. Later that night, you stand behind the bar after closing time, checking the register and chatting with Nick the bartender. That's the last, Nick. We can seal up the joint now. We had a good night. Yeah, some ways. So how was it bad? Oh, I don't know. Good night, Chris. Nick. Huh? So how was it bad? Look, you know your own business. I don't have to tell you about, about anything. What do you know about Matt and Julie that maybe I don't? Okay, so we'll talk in the open. 
You got to get rid of her. She's trouble. Oh, come on. Let's have the rest of it. Well, she's sitting here with Matt tonight, early. Nobody else is around. They don't see me because I'm under the bar fixing things. I hear them talking, and then I don't dare move. They're talking pretty personal. Anyway, the wind-up is this, uh, Julie saying to Matt, I want you, and I'll kill both of us before I let Cressy keep. Hmm. Don't let that throw you, Nick. She's just acting, living it up. Women do it all the time, even me. Well, she's not that good an actress. Why don't you fire her, Cressy? That's no answer. Hmm? What is it? I don't know. I yes. shouldn't have talked, I suppose. But I've been with you a long time, and you've always been swell to me. You made this place, pulled it through tough times. Now it's all gravy. I don't like to see any cheap Easy, sort. Easy, Nick. And thanks. I know how you feel, and I appreciate it. But for now, I'm just waiting. It's happened before, and worn off. Yeah, but not this deep. I have to see this and wear off before I believe it. Night, Chris. Night, Nick. I'll believe it when I see it, too. Well, Cressy, Julie's a bigger fool than you thought she was, isn't she? Maybe you can make it easy for her if she loves Matt as much as he says she does. Yes, Cressy, if all she wants is Matt, maybe you and Julie can make a deal. Mid-afternoon the next day, you park your car on the side street next to the spacious apartment building where Julie lives. As you take a shortcut through the adjacent parking lot, a young man in mechanics overall drives a car into the lot and hails the parking attendant. Hey, Matt! Which is Julie Bradford's parking space? What's this car from the garage? Uh, number four is her space, sir. You want me to park it? No, I'll do it. If you're going to be here, I'll leave the keys in it, okay? Oh, sure, sure. Go ahead. I'll be here. You watch the mechanic park the car in Julie's parking place. Then you enter the apartment building, walk down the corridor leading to Julie's apartment. You're about to press the bell when you hear voices coming from her apartment. Matt's and Julie. You stop a moment, and then turn and walk back a few steps to another door. Instinctively, you try the knob. Open. Service entrance to Julie's kitchen. You enter silently. Move quickly across the kitchen to a spot where you can hear better. I wish you'd see it my way, Julie. Well, you can't read to read and still nothing happens. Now listen to me, Julie. Cressy and me are through. I told you that a hundred times. But I still got to figure out a way of making the break with her and still hang on to my half of the club. There's only one way to make this break, one sure way. And that's to get rid of her for good. That's out. I told you that. Well, then I'm out. Oh, I don't say that, Julie. Even kidding. I'm not kidding. Um... Look at this. Yeah? What is it? Ben got it for me. Just a few drops of this in her drink and ten minutes. That's all. Except they grab us for murder and that's all too. Well, it could look like suicide. Anybody'd know better. That's not like Crescent. Well, we could plan it to make it stick. We'll do it my way, Julie. Well, how long is that going to take? Come here. Don't mess. Now, look, you can't get her. Yeah. Uh, now, listen. I'll think of something. It'll be soon and fine. Don't ask questions. Go on now. Get a couple hours. Later. I'm going home to do the same. I'll come back at six and we'll have a drink together, eh? All right, man. Get some sleep now. Don't worry. I'll, I'll try, man. See you at six, Albert. <laughs> Well, Chris, the issue's quite clear now, isn't it? You wait until you hear Julie walk from the living room into the bedroom and close the door. You're surprised that you're calm. Suddenly, it's as if you'd always known exactly what would happen and what you would do. You wait until you're sure Julie's asleep. Then move quietly into the living room. Cross to the low table in front of the couch and pick up the small box. The poison Julie intended for you. I got news for both of you. This stuff will be curtains, but not for me. Distant pastures 
they say, usually look greener. And that often goes for the other fellow's car, too. But it needn't. If you have to grind and grind on the starter while you see other cars start right off at the first touch, don't envy the other fellow. He's probably just using signal ethyl. When the traffic signal says go and the car next to you zooms out ahead, leaving you with that glued-to-the-spot feeling, don't envy him. He's probably just using signal ethyl. And when your car is laboring up a hill and another car breezes by easily, smoothly, in high, don't envy him. He's probably just using signal ethyl. After all, this premium grade of signal's famous go-farther gasoline is a super-powerful super fuel, scientifically engineered to bring out the best in any car of any age. You'll just never know how smartly your car will perform on signal ethyl until you try a tank full. And there's no time like the present to try it. Yes, Cressy, the die is cast, isn't it? It's you and Club Carlos against your husband, Matt, and Julie Bradford. And now, standing alone in Julie's living room, you suddenly see a solution. The bottle of poison Julie intended for you is in your hand. And with it, Julie's life and Matt's. It's a perfect setup, isn't it, Cressy? Nick, the bartender at your club, Carlos, helped perfect it when he told you about Julie's conversation with Matt. They're talking pretty personal. Anyway, the wind-up is this Julie saying to Matt, I want you, and I'll kill both of us before I let Cressy keep it. Yes, Cressy. Nick will remember that. And what was it Julie and Matt said at your table last night? I always have a drink before I come to the club. Just one. At home. You do? That's funny. So do I. It is perfect, isn't it, Cressy? Now Julie's asleep in her bedroom, and the bottle of poison is held carefully in your gloved hand. Only Julie's fingerprints will show. On the table, you see a decanter filled with whiskey. You quickly pour the poison into it. Then you leave the empty poison bottle just under the edge of the couch, where it can be found when anyone looks for evidence. You've set the trap, haven't you, Cressy? And after a hurried survey, you leave Julie's apartment quickly and quietly, just the way you came. When you reach your car, you suddenly realize you left your car key in Julie's apartment. You put the latch down on the kitchen door. There's no way you can get it without waking Julie. You're stunned. Then it hits you. Just a single key on a chain. It could be Matt's key, too. His key is exactly like yours, and he keeps it on a single chain. And you decide that fits your plan just fine. Satisfied now, you hail a taxi and go home. A little before six, you wake Matt. And while he's in the shower, your confidence in your plan increases. You're certain you will be the sole owner of Club Carlos in a matter of a few hours. Sure did the trick. I was dead to the world when you woke me. <laughs> Maybe I should have quit when I was ahead. Huh? That's a great thing to say. What's the matter with you, Cressy? You got a beef with me? What would I have to beef about? Well, I don't know. Only when you slide over a quick one like that last crack of yours, I figure things aren't exactly rosy with us. Forget it, Matt. Matter of fact, I was just sitting here thinking that I don't know when you meant so much to me. Yeah? How about us having a drink? A short one for the short road, huh? Gee, uh, I can't, Cressy. Not tonight. I got a big appointment on the way to the club. Do there at six. I'll probably have a drink with him. Oh? Anyone I know? Uh, no. Fellow wants to book an act in the club. I told him I'd talk it over with him. Oh, watch it, Matt. I don't want you auditioning any talent without me. Oh, no. This guy just wants to talk to me, that's all. I wouldn't set the deal alone. You know that. Funny thing... Before I went to sleep an hour or so ago, I was thinking about you, too. You and the club. You're an awful smart operator, Cressy. If it wasn't for you, Club Carlos would be just an ordinary junk. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, Matt. It makes me feel wanted, you know? Well, I sure couldn't swing it alone. Couldn't make it click like you do. 
<laughs> well, don't worry, Matt. I got no plans for leaving. You're the guy who's on his way out. Huh? Well, uh, look at the time. If you're going to keep your six o'clock date, you better get going. Oh, hey, you have to take a taxi, though. I left our car at the garage. The clock was slipping. Why didn't you wait until tomorrow morning? Oh, well, okay. I'll grab a cab at the corner. See you at the club, eh? So long, Cressy. Goodbye, Matt. That's it, isn't it, Cressy? The last time you'll see Matt alive. And you don't feel a shred of remorse about it. As you walk to the window, see him standing on the corner, hail a taxi, get in it, and ride away. Your only thought is that once your timetable plays out, Club Carlos will be yours. All yours. You take up your vigil by the clock. Allow Matt ample time to get to Julie's. More time to have a lingering drink with her. And when you feel sure they've shared that last fatal drink from the poison whiskey decanter on Julie's table, you go to the phone and place a very important call. It's Cressy, Julie. I thought you'd be on the way to the club by now. As I, I should be, but I'm, I'm not going in tonight, Cressy. I, uh... Not going in? How come? Anything wrong? I, I feel so strange. I, I, I got all dressed to leave, but all of a sudden I felt sick. Just awful sick. That's too bad, Julie. I... Is Matt there? No. No, he isn't. Please, please, let, let me... Don't give me that stuff, Julie. He's there, isn't he? No, no, Cressy, honest. Look, he was coming there, and I know it. He's got to be there. Okay, Cressy, he was here. But he left just a few minutes before you called. Honest, he did. Cressy, I'm, I'm really getting scared. I feel so... Listen, fun. Julie. Listen carefully. This is important. Did you and Matt have a drink together? Huh? Did you and Matt have a drink together? Yeah. Yeah, yes, yes, we did. But From I... the decanter on the table? Yes, from the decanter. Oh, Cressy, what is this? I'm going to tell you, Julie. Yes, sir, I think you deserve to know. Oh, Cressy, I can't. Please, I can't talk. Never mind, dear. I'll do all the talking. I'll do all the talking from here on in because your poison did my work for me, Julie. And I'm just real grateful to you. Poison? Poison, Cressy, how did you know? Yeah, that little green bottle. It's empty now, Julie, and I'm afraid it's out of your reach. No. You didn't. You couldn't have known. But I did. I heard it all this afternoon, you and Matt. I was there. So you see, I had to call you, Julie. See how you were doing. Just as a matter of courtesy. And I got news for you, kid. You're dead. <laughs> Hello? Hello? One down and one to go. Julie won't be calling the doctor now, will she, Chris? No, Julie won't be calling anyone, ever. And you know now that Matt had a drink from the same decanter of poison whiskey before he left Julie's apartment. It's just a matter of time now, isn't it, Chris? As you wait for the call, you know must come. You change clothes, just as if everything were normal and you were going down to the club as usual. You wonder who'll call, how long it will take. And then, in the middle of your thoughts... Hello? Cressy, this is Nick. Oh, hi, Nick. What's on your mind? Me and here from the distillery. Wants to know if you want the usual order. Oh, well, how does the stock look to you? Will the usual take care of it? Yeah, I think so. That's your answer, then. Just wanted to check with you, Cressy. After all, you're the boss. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Uh, if you want to overlook Matt, that is. Uh, by the way, is he there yet? Uh -huh, not yet, Cressy. Shall I have him call you when he comes in? No. No, I'll be down after a while. I'll see him then. Okay. Sorry to bother you. Not at all, Matt. See you soon. <laughs> You're glad Nick called, aren't you, Chris? Later, if it's necessary, Nick can tell the authorities that he called you at home and that you sounded quite normal, unaware that a double tragedy had occurred. 
and Nick can repeat the conversation he overheard between Julie and Matt, where she said she'd kill them both before she'd give Matt up. Yes, Cressy, Nick can be invaluable to you, if you need it. You move from the phone to a chair. Prepare to wait out your time table. And you hear a knock on your front door. Hello. Are you Mrs. Carlos? Mrs. Matt Carlos? Yes. Yes, I am. My name's Branson, Mrs. Carlos. Please, Lieutenant Branson, may I come in? Why, of course, Lieutenant. Come right in. Won't you sit down? Yes, thanks. I, um... Perhaps you'd better sit down, too. Why? Is anything wrong? Yes, I'm afraid so. I've got bad news for you, Mrs. Carlos. Your husband is dead. Matt. Dead? But how? When did... He was driving a car, and it rammed into an empty warehouse building. Matt killed in an accident. Oh, my... I'm not sure, Mrs. Carlos. He... He had an accident, all right. But the ambulance attendant seems to think that death came as a result of poison. Poison? They're checking on that now, Mrs. Carlos. Another strange thing, this car your husband was driving wasn't registered in his name. Not his car? Well, then who's... Lieutenant, this car Matt was driving, was it a blue sedan? A 1947 Oldsmobile? What? Well, yes, it was. That car belongs to Julie Bradford, singer at our club, Matt's and mine. Nick told me about her threats, but I wouldn't believe it. Now, what threats, Mrs. Carlos, and who's Nick? Nick's a bartender at Club Carlos. I... I don't want to say any more right now, Lieutenant. If I were you, I'd check on Julie Bradford and find out what really happened to Matt. Julie Bradford. All right, Mrs. Carlos, I will check on Oh, you. Matt. Oh, Matt. It's easy. Now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> really sorry, Mrs. Carlos. I'll leave you now. I have a hunch this investigation won't take long. Believe me, I'll do everything I can not to inconvenience you in any way. Did you know that city traffic driving causes three times as much engine wear as highway driving? That's just one of the surprising facts proved by engineers during the development of Signal's amazing new premium motor oil, which reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%. Using startling new scientific techniques never before available to the petroleum industry, these engineers found a way to measure just how much engine wear was taking place, second by second, at every different speed, every different temperature. Then they deliberately set out to develop an entirely new type of lubricant that would reduce engine wear under all the different conditions encountered in driving. The result is new Signal Premium, a motor oil so superior it should keep that light new pep and power in your car twice as long. Yet you pay no increase in price for the extra protection of this heavy-duty type Signal Oil. So to protect your wallet and your car, too, get your next oil change at a Signal service station. Change to Signal Premium, the amazing new motor oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication, 50%. Well, Cressy, you're certain now that you've won, aren't you? After Police Lieutenant Branson leaves to investigate the details of your husband's death, you reflect confidently on the steps you've already taken. You're sure Matt's death and Julie's will appear as murder and suicide once the lieutenant checks your story with Nick, the bartender at Club Carlos. And when Lieutenant Branson finds Julie is dead, he'll also find the key to yours and Matt's car at her apartment. And you've already identified the car Matt was driving as Julie. Yes, Cressy, you're quite pleased with yourself, aren't you? You're sure Lieutenant Branson will return to confirm your story of the uh, double tragedy. And the Club Carlos will be all yours, just as you planned. An hour or so later, you once again usher Lieutenant Branson into your home. We found Julie Bradford, Mrs. Carlos, just as you said we would. Dead from the same poison that killed your husband. Then she did what she said she'd do. Have you talked to Nick? Yes, he repeated the conversation he overheard between Miss Bradford and your husband. I... I didn't think she'd do it. I don't think she did do it, Mrs. Carlin. 
What do you mean? Well, uh, Miss Bradford was wearing a flame velvet costume, one that required a special skin makeup. According to your bartender, that's why she dressed at home instead of at the club. Well, look... It looks to me as if she intended to go to the club tonight as usual. In that case, she wouldn't have poisoned the whiskey that she and your husband drank. But if Julie didn't... That's just it, Mrs. Phelps. If she didn't, someone else did. When did you last see Miss Bradford? Last night, when she finished her act at the club. And uh, when was the last time you were at her apartment? I've never been there. Oh, that's funny. Your car keys were found there. So what? Matt probably... No. Left... His key was in his pocket. Well, he probably took mine, too. He mistook it for his. He left in a pretty big hurry. Mm-hmm. And uh, what time was that? A little before six. He took our car. He took your car and left here a little before six? That's right. I'm afraid it isn't right, Mrs. Carlis. Your husband couldn't have driven your car a little before six. But he did. No, Mrs. Carlis. Your car was parked on the side street near Julie Bradford's apartment most of the afternoon. Oh, you're mistaken. No, we're not mistaken. Neither are they witnesses. You see, at 4.30 this afternoon, a truck backed into your front fender. Bent it so badly, the front wheel wouldn't turn. Well, I, I, I don't know how it got there. It, it must have been... You're lying, Mrs. Carlis. You drove that car to Julie Bradford's apartment this afternoon. And that's when you saw the blue sedan your husband was driving at the time of his accident. The car you identified as Miss Bradford's. You couldn't have seen it anywhere else. But I have. I, I, I've seen them together in it often. No, Mrs. Carlos. Miss Bradford was never in the car you saw. I'm afraid your lies are going to put you right in the gas chamber. But I'm not lying. Oh, yes, you are. Miss Bradford's car is in the garage for repairs. The car you saw delivered this afternoon to the parking lot attendant and identified as Miss Bradford's was a courtesy car the garage sent over while hers was being repaired. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember, regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving. You drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. When you take a chance to save a moment, you take a chance on that moment being your last. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Jeanette Nolan, Ted DeCorsia, G.G. Pearson, Herbert Litton, and Bill Boucher. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Charles Wilson, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at the same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>